So I want you to have your Bibles open to Revelation 4 and 5. And let's talk this morning in this series, Searching for Christ in a World Going Crazy, about the worship perspective. The worship perspective. On Friday night, we had a football game in Atlanta. And if you have ever driven in Atlanta, you know that that is a high-stress experience. Atlanta is two extremes. There is either this one extreme of kind of what you get on I-285, which they ought to rename the NASCAR experience, as you are four wide through the turn, you are bumper to bumper at 212 miles per hour. Or you have this thing called the I-75 parking lot, where you are just going to sit there for hours and hours and hours. But however you do Atlanta, you just get ready to be stressed. Because driving through that place, it is this cluster of congestion and construction and just people everywhere all over you looking desperately for their exit. But have you ever flown into Atlanta? If you've ever flown into Atlanta or out of Atlanta, and I'm not talking about being in the airport, that's horrible in itself, but I'm talking about when you're in an airplane and you're over the city, it's a completely different experience. It's a totally different vantage point because whereas when you're on the ground and everything is all around you and you are looking for a place to go, when you're in an airplane above the city, you can see where everything goes. You can see where all those massive interstates lead. You can see miles where those roads are going to go. And, and it's actually very beautiful. It's actually quite peaceful when you're up in that airplane and, and you're kind of getting it from that vantage point. And, and lately, life has felt a lot like driving through Atlanta, hasn't it? It is it has been bumper to bumper bad news. It has been congestion and frustration and we have this election that's on the horizon and we're all wondering where is this going to lead us? We're all looking at this pandemic thing and wondering where, how long is this going to last? And I think it's safe to say that we're all desperately looking for an exit. I mean, gosh, Linda just let us know she's ready to get out of here right now, right? Just a few moments ago. But, but here's the thing, man. We're all looking for a way out of this thing called 2020. We, we all want to find an exit and navigate this difficult moment of life that we're in. But let me encourage you with this. What if we could just get a different perspective? What if instead of doing life like we're driving through Atlanta, we could do life more like we're flying through Atlanta. And that's exactly what worship does. Worship moves you from driving through a difficult scene to flying over this difficult scene. Worship is top down. Most of us do life bottom up, but, but worship is a perspective that is over things. And you see that demonstrated in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Because I'm going to warn you, next week we are going to turn the page and go into Revelation 6, and it's going to get intense. And what I mean by intense, I'm talking about 2020 times 10 intense. Because you are going to see economic instability. You are going to see global tensions rise. You are going to see a widespread pandemic and you think the death toll was bad with what we're going through now in coronavirus. Man, you ain't seen nothing yet till you begin to turn the pages on the book of Revelation. This is going to get very intense as we go through it. And, but before we go through that, Jesus invites John to a different perspective. If you read John chapter four, or Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John says, After this I looked. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. 
and I will show you what must take place after this. And so before this scene of tribulation unfolds, Jesus says, John, I want you to watch it from here because this is going to be a different vantage point and you will be able to see how all these things unfold and how all these things, where all these things lead. But the very first thing John sees is worship. The very first thing John sees is the throne of God and a place in this universe where truly every living thing that has breath praises the Lord. And that's the way everything is about to be, where everything that has breath praises the Lord. But right now, there's this one place where this is taking place, and it's around the throne room of God. And so Jesus invites John to come look at this. And here's what I want to do this morning. I want to show you how that vantage point of worship transforms the way we go through what we're going through right now. How it transforms the way we go through what we're about to go through in the days ahead. And so let's walk through this vision and understand the perspective of worship. Number one, I want to show you this. Worship is an open invitation, but it is a limited opportunity. It's an open invitation, but it is a limited opportunity. Notice that John says that I looked and behold, there was a door. Now, heaven does not have an open border, but it does have an open door. And the Bible has established this all the way through Scripture, that there is only one way that we have access to God. If you go back to when God designed the tabernacle, He designed it and he put these great walls around it, but there was one way into it. And that through that one door, you had to go past an altar. There's no way that you could enter into that holy place without the sacrifice of blood. Jesus comes and he establishes himself as the door. He says, I am the door of the sheepfold. Later on, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he is inviting us. Jesus says today is the day of salvation. He wants us to come and join this vision as happy worshipers of God. There is an open door that we have access to the Father, and it is through Christ. But understand this, it is a a limited opportunity. One of the things that you're going to see happening in the book of Revelation is that door is closing. And it is going to close on millions of people who choose rebellion instead of worship. And by the time we get to the end of this book, that door will be closed and there will be people standing before a great throne of judgment, being condemned into the lake of fire, into an awful eternity. And so I want to encourage you with the first thing that worship helps us to do as we rise above all that's going on in the world. I want you to see this one 30,000 foot perspective. There's only one decision in your life that really matters. And that one decision in your life that really matters is what you do with Christ. Are you going to uh, repent of your sin and turn to him? Are you going to accept this invitation that he gives us to come into access to the Father through him? Worship is a reminder of the urgency that this life is not about the stuff we have or the things we have to do or what's going on tomorrow. Worship reminds us that there is an urgent decision every person must make to turn to Jesus. Worship reminds us that there is an open invitation, but it is a limited opportunity. I'm begging you today to turn to Christ. Number two, worship reminds us of this. Worship is supposed to be from us for him. From us for him. The, the, the scene unfolds in a beautiful way. He says, I, I stood and I love these words. He says, verse 2, Behold, a throne stood in heaven and one who was seated on the throne. And you're going to see these colors from these brilliant jewels. 
You, you're going to see beautiful things. You're going to see powerful things, flashes of lightning, the rumblings of thunder around this. But I want you to notice also as you read through it how the scene unfolds. It unfolds in, as like concentric circles. In the center is a throne. Around that are 24 elders. Around that are these four living creatures. You're going to read later on. Around them there is this multitude and there's this sea of glass. And, and, and so it, 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 it just unfolds with these ever-growing circles. And at the center of it all is the throne of God. And that sends us this unequivocal message. At the end of the day, there is only one who is up on the throne. He is not up for election. There will be no debate. You will not impeach him. And he is not affiliated with any political party, and he is not waiting on anyone's endorsement. He is the God who is in control of it all. He has always been on the throne. He is on the throne, and he will remain forever on the throne. And we need to understand this. The location of that throne is at the center of it all. That throne is not at the edge of the universe. That throne is not in the leftover places of this universe. Everything comes from this throne, and everything is accountable to the one that is on this throne. And so worship is that thing that reminds us, listen, we do not worship God with the edges of our lives. We don't worship Him with our leftover time, with our leftover energy. We do not give to Him our leftover resources. Listen, we do not come to worship as if God is here trying to do something that impresses us. These words that we sing, these things that we do, this is all supposed to be us bringing things back to the center of it all to Him. And worship is amazing in that it centers your perspective. He is at the center of it all. And worship reminds us of that. And notice the words of worship are important. Notice what they're saying. It says in verse 8 that there's these creatures and they never cease saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Verse 11, they talk about how worthy he is to receive glory and honor and power because he created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now let me tell you what's not happening here. These creatures are not go, crawling out to God going, holy, 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 and he's going, wow, I didn't know that. I, I didn't thank you for telling me that and making me that. Our words to God do not make him holy. They are not crying out to God saying who was and is and is to come, and he is surprised about his role in the universe. That is not what is happening. But they are ascribing to him the truth of who he is. And let me help you understand why that is so important for us to do. Listen, we do not make him what we say he is. We are not creating God by the songs we sing. We do not make him holy by saying his, he is holy. Listen, here's what we are doing. We are affirming the truth at the center of this all, what our God is really like. And that's going to be real important for us. And I'm going to show you why here in just a moment. But here's the thing. In a world of deception and distraction, worship gives you the perspective of what's really true. And in the book of Revelation, you're going to see a lot of deception and a lot of distraction you're going to see a lot of competing voices trying to pull God's people away so that they would worship a false god, a false prophet, a false throne, and enter into a false kingdom. But our time in worship and ascribing to God who he is grounds us in the awe of who God is, and it brings us back to truth. And that's important for us in this age. Because do you understand that at the heart of worship is the word awe? There has to be a sense of, I am impressed. I am overwhelmed. 
I, there, is, there is an unexpectedness to true worship. The Bible describes a lot of people who come before the Lord with the word fear. The fear of the Lord. And that word fear has a sense in it of you have lost control and you're not quite sure what's about to happen, but whatever it is, there's no way you can stop it. That's the word fear. And, and I can think of several times in my life where I felt like that, but I want you to think of a, a moment in your life where, there, where you felt completely overwhelmed and not sure what was going to happen next, and there was nowhere you could go and nothing that you can do. I, I think about 2011 when we were living in, in Birmingham, Alabama, and the, the tornadoes came through that area. We had this devastating tornado that went through Tuscaloosa. It stayed on the ground for a long time, and, and I remember that, that I, I looked at, at my wife and, and my daughters, and we're down in the basement watching television because I kind of knew the, the tracks of those storms, and when that one went through Tuscaloosa and it went by Bryant-Denny Stadium, I looked at Shannon and I said, that thing's headed right for us. Because we lived in the northeast part of Jefferson County, Alabama, and I, I saw the track and where it was headed. And so we got down in the basement, and, and there was this sense of, we don't know what's going to happen to us. This is huge. It is powerful. And we have no idea. We can't go anywhere. We are at the complete mercy of this moment. And there is a sense in which worship is supposed to be like that. You are at the complete mercy of being in the presence of someone who is uncontrollable by you. But we have lost our sense of awe because we have made our entire lives eight inches of glass. And we are not impressed by much anymore, are we? Listen, if we really want to be worshipers and understand who our God is, we need to reconnect with truth. And listen to me, church, we need to quit trying to control God. And we need to fall before the power and the mercy of who He is, bringing ourselves to Him. Number three, it brings me to this point, worship is surrender of control. Chapter five, we have a crisis. He says, and I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on a throne a scroll, and it's got writing on the front and on the back. And it is sealed with seven seals, which means it is completely sealed. And here's the, the crisis. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Now, why is it important for these, this scroll to be opened? Because this scroll is the, is the will of a sovereign. The king would take a scroll and he would write his commands on that scroll, what he wanted to be carried out in the kingdom, and he would seal it, and only certain people were, were able to open those seals and to carry out the king's commands. And so here we are at the center of the universe, and he is looking for someone worthy to open the scroll. Now, here's where the crisis is. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. The reason this moment is so desperate and the reason this moment is so tragic is because if no one is able to open the scroll, then John's fate is in the hands of Rome. And it is in the hands of Satan himself. Rome was a corrupt, bloodthirsty government. It was slaughtering Christians for following Jesus. And John sees that scene, and he's got to be thinking, man, if no one can open the scroll of the almighty, holy God and carry out his future, then my future is left into the hands of a godless group of people who are going to crush us. But then the good news is this. He says, then the elder said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That word lion is a symbol of sovereignty. The root of David, he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And man, you are about to see worship erupt because the future is in the hands of a holy, almighty God, not from the, th the, the seed of Rome. 
And I want to tell you, if you right now are thinking that our entire future is going to be determined by Washington, D.C., you are driving through traffic. You are not flying above it, man. And right now, we need to, especially as Christians, to, we, we've got to be involved in the process. We've got to vote. We can't just disengage from those sorts of things. We have responsibility as good citizens of this nation. But at the same time, we need to have a 30,000-foot view of what's going on. And listen, we need to have this perspective. Whoever is elected and whoever thinks they are in control, the scroll is not in their hand. The scroll of our future is in the hand of God. That is where our future lies. And let me tell you, I'm about to give you a, a difficult perspective. This future in the book of Revelation that the, the people of God are about to walk through is not fun. If you think on that scroll is our escape from persecution, that is not on the scroll. On the scroll is how God is going to use our persecution. If you think that all the things that are on the scroll are good days, I want to tell you, you had not read the book of Revelation, because when you unroll that scroll, you're about to see some awful days. If you think the only thing that's on that scroll is prosperity, you haven't read the book of Revelation, because you're going to see that part of the will of God is going to be blood. And His people are going to suffer greatly as these demonic powers begin to vie for attention on the earth. This is going to be a difficult time. And listen, part of having that scroll and understanding that it is in the hands of an almighty God gives God's people this perspective. Lord, even if you call me to suffer and loss, I want to stay faithful because I know at the end of the day, you're the one who holds a scroll and this is your will for me, use me, just strengthen me through this. And I think in 2020, God's people have lost that perspective because we think the only will of God for us is prosperity, and that is a lie from the pit of hell. Part of the will of God for us is for us to suffer and stay faithful and to be a witness of the gospel despite the difficulty we go through. In the mid-1500s, Martin Luther, who was the leader of the Reformation, he wrote one of my favorite hymns. It's called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And I want to read to you the last two verses of that hymn. And I want you to listen how different these words are compared to kind of what we think we're asking God to do in worship. Listen to this. He, so, he says, Though this world with devils filled. That's, that's driving through Atlanta right there, full of devils, right? I mean, Martin Luther's going through a hard time. He's suffering persecution. He feels like the devil's after him everywhere he goes. He said, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage, listen, he doesn't say we can't escape. His words are his rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Now pay attention to the last verse. He says, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours. In other words, he says, God has given us enough through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go. Now, I want to tell you this. If you're living life trying to get all you can get and keep on to it, you're driving through Atlanta. You're not flying through Atlanta. Martin Luther says, if I lose everything I've got, he says, I can let it go. He says, this mortal life also, he understands I may die. Not despite the will of God. He says, but I may die in the will of God. He says, this mortal life also, he says, and listen to this, this body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. 
And here's a man suffering persecution, not knowing how much longer he is going to live, writing those words saying, God, if I lose it all, even my very life, at the hands of devils, I'm yours. That's the perspective of who has the scroll. He is in control. Whenever we come in to worship God, it reattaches us to this reality. The future is His. And we have a calling to be faithful to Him. Number four, worship is our continued response to the gospel. I love this, chapter 5, verse 6, between the throne. Now he sees the one who's worthy to grab the scroll. Between the throne of four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. You need to understand, our future is not free. It was costly. It cost the Son of God his life, but he is risen. He is standing. He's alive. And he goes and he takes the scroll and they fall down before the lamb, whereas the lion is a picture of sovereignty. The lamb is a picture of sacrifice. And they bring these bowls, which are the prayers of the saints. And it says they sang a new song. And this song is about the effect of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God. And then I looked and I heard around the throne, living creatures and the elders, a voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Because Jesus has died for us and risen from the grave, many people have responded to the gospel. And there will be a multitude from every tribe, tongue, and kindred. That is the vision of God that every nation would worship him. And so we need to understand this perspective that worship gives us. Do you understand this? Worship is evangelism, and evangelism is worship. I think a lot of times we think worship is this one thing we do, and then we are supposed to tell people about Jesus. You realize ultimately at stake in this entire thing is we tell people about Jesus because we want them to join in with us in worship of him. We want them to become worshipers like we are. And, and you know, next year, I believe that, that God is calling us to share the gospel so that 100 people are saved and baptized within the ministries of Liberty Baptist Church. I'm going to spend the next several weeks laying out just little bit by little bit what that looks like and how you can be involved. But in all those different things that we think are important to do, I want you to understand this. Do you understand, Liberty Baptist Church, that we will reach countless people with the Gospels if we become joyous, happy worshipers who are content in our God, obedient to His will, concerned for our holiness, and enthusiastic about who is on that throne. If we do that, listen, lost people will be coming here wondering why we are what we are. If we want to reach the nations, we must proclaim in worship who our Jesus is. That is the perspective. And then Number five, we need to understand this. The perspective worship gives us is worship is God's answer to our prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You remember when the apostles are watching Jesus pray? And man, that must have been quite a sight. Can you imagine listening to Jesus pray? And he finishes. And they go, hey, teach us how to pray like you just prayed. And he said, okay, so when you pray, say this. He says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, what? On earth as it is in heaven. And the Bible has been establishing this intersection between heaven and earth ever since the beginning. God created a garden. He said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. You have dominion and fill it. And, and you look at the last part of the Bible and heaven and earth meet together. That's the ultimate vision of God is there to be this, this seamless intersection between heaven and earth. Remember when Jacob was on the run from his brother Esau and he goes out into the desert and he lays his head on a stone and he falls asleep and he gets a vision of a ladder. And there's a ladder that touches earth and it reaches up into heaven and he sees angels 
ascending and descending this ladder. And he wakes up, and I love the words that he says. He says, God was in this place, and I did not know it. And then he builds a tabernacle, and he fills that tabernacle. God comes to earth, and he's in the temple. And then there's Jesus. And remember when Jesus is in this conversation with Andrew and Nathaniel? And they're so impressed because Jesus saw Nathaniel sitting under this tree. And Jesus says, man, if you think that was big, you hadn't seen nothing yet. He says, man, you will see on me the angels of heaven. It's the vision of the ladder ascending and descending. He says, man, I'm the intersection of this all. Do you, do you understand that the desire of God is for your life and my life? Lordship means this. That you and your home and your surrender to the sovereignty of God are places where heaven and earth collide. We are living his kingdom now. That's what it is. And he is calling all of earth, the will on heaven or the will on earth to be done as it is in heaven. That's his call. That's his command. And you know what the book of Revelation is? The book of Revelation is the final opportunity for us to get that right. And it's going to be an amazing witness. You're going to see witnesses who come and, and they're calling the people to, to worship the Lord. And they're going to slaughter those witnesses. But it's amazing. They resurrect from the grave. And you would think, man, they're going to, they're going to turn to God now, but they don't. And then through, through, through manifold suffering, God is going to pour out his wrath on this world. And you would think at the end of that, they would cry out, God, please have mercy. But yet we still insist on in our sin against the rebels of God. Listen, on the will of God on earth, as is done in heaven, you are going to see in the book of Revelation the last opportunity to get that right. But in the book of Revelation, you're going to see the final rebellion against that very thing. Look at what the world is trying to do to us right now. Whether it's coronavirus or politics or what have you, the world right now is trying to convince all of us that we are dependent on it. The Republicans are trying to tell us, no, no, no you need to do our will on earth as Republicans would do it. The Democrats are telling us, no, no, you need to do our will on earth. The coronavirus saying, no, if you, if, if we're in such a crisis, if you'll follow us and do this and you do our will, it's going to, you see, everybody is creating this crisis telling us, you got to have me and do my will and it will save you. You see, the world rebels against God's will on earth being done as it is in heaven. And this the book of Revelation is the final act of rebellion. And in the end of that thing, listen, God is going to come and crush that rebellion. And he is going to sentence every person who's been a part of that rebellion to a burning lake of fire where they will suffer for an eternity. And then heaven and earth, new heaven and new earth will be created. Heaven will come down and it will meet earth and it will be like that forever. And so worship is God's final answer that the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. And listen, when we worship him, we proclaim that now. Worship is a 30,000 foot view that right now we are the collision of this. Do you realize that if we would get off of our high horse of thinking that we are in control, and we would surrender to the sovereignty of God. And we would be more concerned for our holiness than we are our happiness. That we would be more concerned for a bold proclamation of the gospel than we are our prosperity. If we would be more concerned in prayer than we are on social media. If we would be just... just just surrendered before the throne of God, worshiping him, instead of trying to drive through the traffic of this world and looking for an exit, if we would do what he calls us to do and rise above it, do you realize there is a spiritual power where heaven and earth collide in God's people that we can move this thing like you've never seen it move before? If we would connect to the one who's really in control. And that's what worship does continuously. 
it reminds us that our ultimate goal is for then your home and in my home and in my influence and your influence, your workplace, my workplace, your relationships, my relationships, our time together and our time apart is ultimately about one thing. We are the intersections of heaven and earth where God's will is to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And one of these days, that prayer will finally be answered. And so the ultimate question is this. The question is not whether or not you came to church today. Congratulations, you're here. The question is, are you a worshiper of Jesus? If you are not, and you continue in the rebellion, and guys, I just almost put this out there. I'm real concerned. It's been a tough year. It's been an aggravating year. I mean, it's just been, uh, right? There are so many in our congregation who have shrunk back over a challenge. I'm not saying it's not been challenging. So many in our congregation have shrunk back. And here's what I worry. If you stop doing the things that you were doing because of coronavirus, maybe you ain't seen nothing yet. Are you a worshiper of Jesus? That's the question. So I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me, whether you're watching at home or you're here in the auditorium. And I want to ask you the question, are you trying to drive through the traffic of all this stuff going on in life, or are you coming from the perspective of a worshiper to rise above it, to see it from the, from the standpoint of top down, a God who is in control and who is carrying out a will, and you and I are to be agents as obedient servants of the agenda that he is about to carry out. And that's going to call us to a hard time. Are you willing to suffer for the one who holds the scroll? Are you willing to live a holy life before the one who they ascribed holiness and honor and power and might? I want to pray for you. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. I want to encourage you to come. We'll take the Word of God and show you how to be saved. Or maybe you're here and you just want to pray about some other things. Or maybe you're, you're thinking, man, I've shrunk back. And God, I need your strength. And I need to endure. Maybe God's calling you to some hard things right now and you don't know what to do with it. And you want to look at this sovereign God and fall before his throne and say, God, tell me what's on that scroll. What's the next step you want me to take in this? And Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, the one who is at the center of it all. And we surrender our wills to you. Lord, help make us worshipers who aren't distracted by all the deceit going on in this world, but Lord, help us to understand that we are of your kingdom. And we are here to let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I pray that you would save souls. God, I pray you would revive the church. Lord, I pray that you get us ready for these days ahead. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together if the Lord's calling you to come?